Welcome to episode one of Leadership Unplugged. When Mo and I set out on this journey earlier this year, we had one goal in mind, and that was to speak to and learn from people who inspire us. Our first guest, Craig Fenton, embodies this. Wearing many hats, Craig is the Chief Strategy and Operations Officer of Google UK and Ireland. He also runs big community records and productions, both independent labels supporting talented artists from less privileged backgrounds. In this episode, Craig opens up about his childhood growing up in New Zealand, his early career as a lawyer and his pivot into the world of tech. We discuss failure, authentic leadership and what it takes to succeed in a rapidly changing world. Welcome Craig to the Leadership Unplug podcast. We're happy to have you as a guest and obviously thank you for taking time out of your really busy schedule to sit down with us. You're welcome. Nice um, to see you guys. So the idea behind the podcast is we're trying to test a hypothesis, um, which is that the leaders that we see today and the traits and characteristics they exhibit, a lot of those are actually found in their earlier years or the traits that they have are, are taught and learned in those early years. We also kind of want to learn from leaders like yourself, what lessons you guys have gone through and kind of what lessons you take from them and apply them to what you're doing now. So on that end, maybe let's start off with, you can tell us a little bit about your childhood and maybe time in New Zealand as well. I'm here to prove or disprove this hypothesis. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, so I grew up in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. As you can probably hear from the accent, I've been in the UK now for 25 years. It hasn't really softened it much, has it? <laughs> but uh, yeah, wonderful place to grow up, very isolated. Uh, first time I went abroad was with my father when I was 11 years old. And up until then, New Zealanders, all I knew was all I knew. Um, it's about the same uh, landmass as the UK, but a population when I was there at least of 3 million. So the mm. density is, is a lot lower. And... You, you have to sit on a plane for a minimum of eight hours to reach a country other than Australia, which is oh, wow. in many ways, at least culturally, a lot like New Zealand. So um, very isolated place, splendid isolation, I would say, and very outdoorsy and uh, relaxed. And I would say it's sort of got a playful innocence about it. And I think that's still true. You know, you don't know the rules. You're not really part of the global economy. It certainly that wasn't true when I was uh, young and uh, therefore you, you, you didn't know the rules, you didn't know you were breaking them and, and there was this sort of, there was a saying called the number number eight wire approach, right? You, you, you kind of have to figure it out and the number eight wire is a fencing wire. Okay. So there's this sort of Kiwi ingenuity concept of if you didn't know the answer, you kind of just had to figure it out and make it up as you go along and I think that uh, that culture is certainly imbued in me. Um, so went all the way through school there, mm -hmm. also did my undergraduate degree there and had the first phase of my professional career uh, in New Zealand before moving to the UK. Couldn't possibly move further away. Uh, <laughs> yeah. in, uh, when was it? 98. And did, uh, did, did you, you moved here, I believe, for, to go to business school? Was it after you had done your undergraduate uh, in law back in, back in New Zealand? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I did a, what's called a conjoint degree. So I did a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of Laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the full law degree rather than a conversion. I think you can do a conversion here. Um, and each degree, one, uh, the Bachelor of BCom, a sort of standard BCom is three years. A standard law degree was four years. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do them together, you can complete them sort of in an overlapping way in five mm -hmm. rather than one, you know, one plus the other. And at that time, most of my cohort either turned left and went uh, into accounting, you know, if they <laughs> wanted to follow the BCom B line, much like you guys, uh, or you turned right and went into law, and I went into law. So I was a, a, a barrister. Um, in, in New Zealand, it's what co what's called a fused bar. So you're a barrister and solicitor, but you okay. tend to do either sort of corporate-based work, uh, contractual, commercial, or you do court work. And I did court work, primarily court work, for uh, six years, actually. It was uh, a fair stint. Did um, some really interesting stuff, uh, very, um, very stimulating. Uh, worked on the first deal that made rugby a professional sport in the Southern Hemisphere and created what at the time was called the Tri-Nations and the 
NPC and uh, and uh, the Bledisloe Cup was part of that, and so it was Australia, New Zealand, and um, South Africa and News International pumped a whole lot of money in. Mm. Uh, we did a lot of privatisation work, did councils, did some insurance work, so really a broad cacophony of stuff, but figured out fairly early on, well, at least before I became a partner, that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. And this was the dawn of the internet. It was 98, mm -hmm. and I found that intoxicating and um, interest, uh, interesting, and I kind of wanted to put myself in the middle of it, but I didn't really know how. So I thought I'd go back to university and figure it out, and that's what uh, brought us to the UK. I went uh, to London Business School, did an <coughs> MBA there, and that was kind of my, I guess, rebranding. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and in terms of, you mentioned that technology is quite, it was a very new concept, especially the tech startup scene. Um, and being a lawyer, was there kind of, when me and Mo were looking at your background, we were kind of thinking, is, was it like an overarching purpose or a guiding light which helped you make those decisions to move to technology? Or was it something which you found later on in your life was that purpose and guiding light? Uh, yeah, I used to spend a lot of time with my grandfather, who was a, he was a doctor, but I knew him more as a sort of tinkerer. He was one of those mm -hmm. uh, people who had a shed and a bunch of junk in that shed and used to make stuff, right? Circuitry, mechanical items. And I suppose at a, at a fairly early age developed a fascination and interest in, I suppose you'd call it engineering, like basic engineering, yeah. building stuff. And I remember having circuit sets and, you know, making radios and alarm systems and... Uh, because of the business my father was in, we, we got one of the earliest uh, computers and I developed a fascination in that. So I suppose at an early age, my curiosity led me into the space and I've always been a kind of a bit of a gadget geek. <laughs> you know, love technology. I find it fun and, and yeah. a little bit like magic still. And, uh, you know, and, and so I, I suppose there were those formative streaks that, that drew me in. And, you know, 98 was the really the wild west it was the emergent phase of the internet much like um 2022 arguably you know certainly um in the last sort of uh, two to five years is, is an emergent phase phase for technologies like blockchain and um mm -hmm. ai in a, in a practical sense so i i suppose that that drew me in but i, I really had no idea how to become part of it and post the mba i went into Again, you went left into finance. So London yeah. Business School is very known for its finance. Or you went right into consulting and a few completely insane people went in and started their own companies. It wasn't a very common thing to do back then in, uh, in 2000. And I went into consulting. I went into a company called Accenture, mm -hmm. which although consulting in the, in, in the advisory sense has a long and deep history in technology and, and really they built the, the backbone of that business of implementing um, IT systems, mm -hmm. early, early IT systems. So, yeah, we just want to touch on a theme that you brought up there. I think and it was partly this point you made about the, the Kiwi culture of kind of the, you figure it out if you, if you, don't, if you don't know how to do something. Um, and the point that you, you made kind of a couple of transitions in your career, starting in law, obviously doing the, the, doing the, the MBA, going to consulting, and sales, negotiations, a variety of different things. I think we live in a day and age where that is becoming increasingly common, where people, especially young people who are starting off their careers now or in the early stages of their career, are more and more likely to switch between different careers and multiple times. Um, I just wanted to understand from you how you approach that process in terms of weighing up the pros and cons, giving yourself the confidence to actually leave something you had, you had built up some expertise in, for example, law, and kind of starting in a completely new, a new industry. Uh, just thinking through what, what kind of thoughts and process went into that. Did you consult with others? Um, how did that decision making go for you? I think a lot of people have probably described the decision-making process as a combination of reckless and impetuous, but uh, <laughs> at the time I'm not sure I gave it um, much thought other than I felt I'd done my time in law and I was attracted by something else and I wanted to follow my curiosity. And I think it's important to do that, right? Um, I, I think your observation is uh, is right, Mohammed. It's, um, you know, we live in an age where 
many of us will, will change careers many times. And I think that's ageless, by the way. It's not just young people. It's anybody in a profession now, you know, mm. myself included, uh, will um, touch wood have, uh, have many different phases. And actually, they're not always sequential anymore. Mine, I'm describing mine as a sort of linear se- and, a, and a sequential journey. Uh, it's more common these days to have a portfolio at the same time you know, uh, whether it's side hustles or things mm-hmm. you guys are doing a podcast, but your day jobs at PwC, that's a great example, and I think is more normal uh, these days. So I think the, um, you know, the important thing in all of that is to know yourself, figure out what your passions are, or really what, you know, what you are curious about, what you want to follow your nose on, so to speak, and just go do it. Right, because the the thing about staring at the horizon, right? I'll do this, that, and the other thing, and then you know I'll arrive at the sort of far off hillside that I can see. Problem with the horizon is it never gets closer, <laughs> right? So uh, uh, no time like the uh, like the present, and um, you don't need to have all the answers. In fact, we live in an age where, by definition, you won't even in your profession. You know, mastery is uh, is is somewhat uh, elusive and certainly perishable, because the world's just changing too quickly uh, to uh, to uh, to to be masterful at anything um, for a sustained period of time. So I think it's a it's a um, it's a normal state uh, rather than something scary uh, to uh, to be excited by. Yes, yeah, so I guess I think. I'm going to back, go back to 98. So you've, you've kind of packed your bags up. You've flew God knows how long, like 12 plus hours to come to London. You've landed in London. Now you're doing your MBA. It was, I think it was for maybe one or two years long. Um, what I'm interested to hear is kind of what, what are the two or three things which you learned during that period of your life which you still think you use today and still really relevant today? Well, first of all, 12 hours will get you halfway. <laughs> it's uh, about 30 hours door to door. Oh, God. Um, I've just come back, actually, and it took me 72 for various oh, God. Re- various different reasons. It's a, it's a long, old way. But, um, you know, it felt like a big step at the time. I had a good job. I was well paid with just my uh, now wife, then girlfriend, and I had just bought our first house. Uh, and I threw it in. Like I, I quit my job. I had nothing to go to. Uh, we uh, sold the house. We sold the car. I convinced my girlfriend uh, to join me on this sort of perilous journey. And she actually su- ended up supporting me. She's she was qu- uh, a qualified lawyer as well, so she uh, ended up supporting me in London while I was a, a student. And we were living on limited savings denominated in New Zealand currency, which at the time was three to the pound. And that went pretty quickly. So I very, very quickly lost all of our cumulative um, assets and, mm-hmm. and, and wealth, um, descending quite deeply into interest-bearing debt and had really no certainty on the other side. And that, and that was a an intimidating exciting but you know it was real man you know uh, and uh you know i always sort of comforted myself to say well you know if it doesn't work out there's a bridge back i've got some good connections and i'll just go back and um ask for my my job back but uh, you know it's not quite as as simple as, as that and that got really real about halfway through the mba uh, it's a it is a twenty one month course at London mm-hmm. Business School, and what you do halfway through is you go and get a summer internship. You you start applying for jobs, and this is a sort of well oiled machine. And I I just couldn't get one. I ended up I think I interviewed with something like uh, thirty two companies. Uh, I did more than fifty interviews. And I got rejected by all of them. You know, who was I? This no-name dude from a <laughs> isolated place that no one had heard of who went to a school that no one had heard of, who was a lawyer, you know, that was the badge I carried with me, um, who's got the cheek to apply for some sort of business role. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know there was no, no recognisable brand name in anything that I'd done. Uh, and, uh, you know... 
it kind of got real. I thought, geez, mm-hmm. have I made a real big mistake here? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it became comical, actually. We started, you know, we talked about these letters as dings. Oh, I got another ding today. I got three dings today. <laughs> you know, it's a record ding day. Uh, and, uh, you know, eventually I found a place that, that, that would take me. Uh, it turned out to be a great place to work, Willis. Um, they're, a, um, they're in the insurance industry, actually. Um, so sort of eventually landed on my feet, but it was a bit of a wake-up call. I thought, geez, I, you know, I... I I don't have a brand that's in any way differentiated um, that stands out from the crowd. So what is it that I do control? Well, I can control how hard I work. Mm -hmm. So I'd better get my head down and start getting some grades. And there's this thing called the Dean's List, right? If you do super well uh, and you're in the top 10% uh, of students, or is it the top 10 students? I can't remember now. You get onto this Dean's List and, and there are certain companies that just target the Dean's List. So um, managed to sort of put the head down, do some study, got onto the dean's list, and then started getting lots of offers. Right. Uh, but prior to that, I mean, it just shows you, right? Your 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 main fuel is within you, and mm-hmm. you've got to create a uh, a space uh, a, and a sense of differentiation, differentiation, like any brand. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting, and uh, I can think back to. I think our, when we start off our careers, the number of rejection applications, application <laughs> rejections you get, and it is a really common thing in universities. And I think getting your foot in the door is, is, is often the, the hard part and uh, having the motivation to keep persevering until you get the opportunity uh, can sometimes be difficult. Um, just kind of looking forward now, as, as you say, you, you had you, you failed with, kind of, uh, with the application stage somewhat in the, uh, to get internships, then you pulled through, got onto the Dean's List, uh, what drew you towards uh, kind of Accenture and where you where you actually ended up in the consulting and sales slash strategy type of space? Um, what is it that drew you, and how did you actually kind of go, get get into that space and start building the foundations of a career there? I didn't know much about consulting. I thought my plan at the time was was look, uh, I think that's going to give me some exposure to different companies and in different industries. So um, let's say a little bit of paid business tourism, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, in the real world, and then, you know, I'll do that for a couple of years and then go get a real job, right, which I imagine to be a line job in um, in, in industry of some, uh, of some description. And consulting, I didn't know really that much about it. Um, I liked the people I met. Um, they seemed to like me enough to give me an offer, uh, so that helped. Uh, and uh, I, I felt... Um, drawn to the communications, media, and technology space, which was where the where the offer was, and I thought that sounds cool and fun, so I'll go and do that. And uh, so it turned out. I think consulting gives a good a good til- toolbox of sc- skills. It gives you problem solving skills, good um, structuring skills, presentation, communication, analytical. Uh, so it develops all of those sort of basic tools uh, quite well. And more importantly, I think it gives you exposure to different companies, to different industries, different organization structures. And in my case, I ended up working across Europe uh, and uh, Latin America and the Middle East. And it gave me deep experience as in sort of not just flying in for a meeting, but building teams and owning targets in different countries in Europe. And that's the wonderful thing about living in uh, in this continent uh, you know we've just got a, a, an amazing sort of patchwork of cultures uh, out there slightly more distant post the referendum in t- uh, 2016 but um, nevertheless you know it's on our doorstep and it's beguiling and, and, and super interesting so you know uh, I worked with many many companies in different stages of digital transformation digital distress or digital leadership and it was fascinating uh, to uh, to see it, and my learning from all of that time was, you know, the the hard part about technology is not the technology. Mm-hmm. Change is very human, and mm-hmm. uh, and, and that uh, that I think remains <laughs> remains my sort of key key learning. Uh, having having been six years and counting in in Google, the digital age is more than ever a human age. Mm. That, that is that's quite interesting observation. Never really thought about it from the human lens and the human perspective. Um, 
I think so. One one thing that I'm also interested in learning about a bit more was I, I find that a lot of times, especially amongst the newer generations of workforces that are coming in, there's this idea that failure isn't good, or we should try and kind of hide our failures and kind of shield them away from our, the people that are senior to us, so that we're seen as the strongest candidate or the best employee. Um, I, I know for a fact for me there's definitely been some failures in, in, in my career even though it's still very young uh, the leaders that I spoke to at our workplace a lot of them talk about some missteps or failures that they've had um, I guess during, during your work life and maybe Accenture considering that it takes up the large majority of it um, does any like significant failure come to mind I think, and how did you kind of deal with that and what do you take from that failure going forwards oh, there's a, a very long list to too long for a podcast series, let alone a single <laughs> episode. But let me start with the premise, which is uh, that, that failure is somehow you know something that should be shielded and uh, hidden away or, um, or avoided. I completely disagree with that. I think failure is glorious. It's essential. It should be celebrated. Because if you succeed in something that, you, that you're doing, you kind of already knew the answer right? Mm -hmm. You've not grown in any way. It's only failure that teaches you. It's only failure that leads you to something new, different, uh, on a higher level. Mm -hmm. And in a context, you know, we talked about this earlier, of constant change, mm -hmm. right? That, that is the only constant, actually. Uh, yeah. None of us know the answer. You, you don't start with the answer and execute it well. You start... Uh, by not knowing and experimenting and figuring it out. And that is just increasingly true. And you see it in the data, right? The half-life of companies is getting shorter and shorter. Companies that were absolutely dominant in their industry today don't exist. And that's increasingly common that the top 10 companies by market cap today is almost entirely different uh, than what it was 10 years ago. I think there's only one on that list that's, that's still there, Microsoft. So I think this is true in business and it's true in, in life as well. We talked about skills being, or mastery at least, being perishable. You know, it, it, it exists for a short time and then, then you move on. So in that context, your ability and comfort with ambiguity, not knowing, but courageously stepping up to the plate and giving it a go and figuring it out and falling on your face and picking yourself up and, and moving on is the difference between good and great, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So are there examples in my life? I mean, we talked about, you know, coming to a crashing wake-up call right in the middle of my MBA, you know, sort of which was like being punched in the face shortly after entering the rugby pitch, right? It's like you <laughs> emboldened and here I am sort of entering the game and, and you get struck pretty quickly and, and, and get a wake-up call. But there are, there are many of those uh, examples every week. I start every team meeting by talking about my glorious failure of the week. Why? Because I think failure is important to progress, to innovation. It's critical to show vulnerability to give others the psychological safety that they can do likewise and and, and try things take smart risks mm -hmm. um, because if you're not doing that i think it's a it's a very fast route to obsolescence and in my consulting days i worked with many many companies who were too cautious and now they don't exist one example is nokia right mm -hmm. in nokia the the old handset provider. Yeah. You guys might be too young, but yeah. remember the 6210 phone? Amazing. Know. The battery lasted for three weeks. You can <laughs> send text messages to people. There was sort of a snake. snake. You can play <laughs> snake. And it was just an awesome. Nokia had the best mobile programmers in the world, this Finnish company. And if you were to give a talk about innovation at, in, in, in let's say, uh, you know, 2007, 2008, Nokia probably would have been the example, right? They started mm -hmm. in forestry, they made rubber boots, they turned into a technology company. They were on top of the world and had more share of the handset market than all of the others put together in 2007. And then this guy called 
Steve Jobs came onto a stage in his turtleneck <laughs> jumper and announced the iPhone, which actually Nokia had a version of, right? Really? Oh. A buttonless uh, touchscreen phone. Uh, and they collectively and individually missed an important change. They missed that the market had moved. It was not about the device or not only about mm -hmm. the device anymore, but also about the ecosystem that device accessed and enabled. And today, Nokia, in, in its handset uh, manifestation, doesn't exist. I mean, there's a few IP licenses out there, and that's it. You still see the odd phone, but they're sort of made under license, and 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 they kind of saw it uh, too late. So, um, a great example of uh, of um, failure to spot change, failure to innovate, failure to uh, be. Um, bold enough to cannibalize your own business uh, or at least take risks um, and, and, and be willing to fail. Uh, and these were individually some of the best and brightest people in the world. They still are yeah. in different companies now, but probably wiser for it. Mm. I just wanted to <clears throat> follow up on a, on a point you made there. I think it's a general theme of your, of your answer. I think as a concept, I think we all understand that failure is good and failure and mistakes are what you learn from. I think one of the things that can be quite challenging, especially in the early stages of, uh, of careers and also when you're making that initial transition into, into more of a managerial role where you're no longer kind of a, a young fresher who's, uh, who's kind of able to ask all the questions, where you need to start almost balancing bringing your genuine self to work and bringing that genuine curiosity and appetite for failure versus inspiring confidence and almost creating an air of, of, uh, of being competent and trustable, trustworthy and being able to execute your job, especially, I think, in client-facing roles, as you might have experienced in consulting. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are going through that stage and that kind of grapple between those two uh, and, and how, to, how to get the best of both? I think it probably differs depending on what you're in. Like you, you, you don't want to walk into a denti dentist's office and hear from them that they're kind of just figuring out how to do a filling for the first time, right? You, you want a, a base level sense of expertise and, uh, and, and confidence and, and, and competence. Um, I, I think in business is not quite as static as, as something like, you know, the physical form. You know, doctors get to... Uh, work with the human human body, of course, these diseases that we've seen recently come and go and evolve, etc. So there is an element of change, but the human physique is is fairly static. What we're talking about, I think, more is the the world of business, and certainly that's the world that I occupy. And there, I challenge the premise actually that uh, a leader, and certainly more a senior one, needs to exhibit and exude. Confidence. I think what they need to exude is authenticity. Mm -hmm. Humans follow humans, mm -hmm. and it's inhuman to be impenetrable uh, and um, you know uh, all knowing. You know that, that that's just not the reality. So I think humble leadership that comes with a good dose of vulnerability is the most endearing. And humans will follow humans, right? You need to see yourself in someone to follow them, I think. If they're this sort of uh, slightly artificial, godlike figure with this sort of facade of, per uh, of perfection, you know, that's an intimidating and unrealistic um, presence. So my experience is that actually whether you're entering your career or progressing through management ranks and uh, or uh, you're, the, you're the captain of a, of a company, uh, being humble, vulnerable and authentic uh, are the key attributes. And what you've got to be, I think, is not confident in the answer necessarily, but have the conviction to decide uh, with good reason and engage a following uh, around it and also bold enough to call it when you get it wrong. Mm -hmm. In terms of the three attributes you just mentioned there, 
Is, is, is that something which you've picked up from others that you've observed as kind of good leaders in your career? Or is that something which you've kind of had to find yourself making maybe the wrong decision or the right decision? Yeah, um, a little, a little bit of both, I would say. You know, I've, I've been lucky to work with some astonishingly good people in, in my, in my time, and um, you know, hopefully, long may that continue. And I've made mistakes and and figured out, you know, the things, the characteristics of uh, of poor change mm-hmm. management, for example. Uh, and it tends to sort of boil down to those sorts of features. The people I like and want to follow are human, they're humble, they're vulnerable, they're authentic. Um, you know, what you see is what you get. Yeah. And transparent and, and all of those things. So that's my experience as a person who looks to a leader or a mentor. Uh, but it's also my experience as a, you know, practitioner and a leader myself. Mm-hmm. I think there's actually an angle I want to look at here is, because I, having kind of read about you and and kind of did some general searching, um, we found that you kind of you've angel invested in a lot of small startup businesses. So it, when when you're looking to invest in a business, they usually say a lot, some of it's financials, but actually the key thing you're looking for are the people in the business and how they're going to kind of grow it and take it on going forwards. When you're looking at potentially investing in a company, you're looking at their leadership panel, maybe the CEO or the guy that's running it. What are, what are those key attributes you're looking for? Do they kind of link back to what you were saying earlier or are they slightly different from an investor's perspective? Yeah, most investors will invest in the team and the, you know, the, the leader, uh, all leaders, many are co-founders these days. You know, he or she needs the resilience to, uh, to know and under, or the humility, I should say, that uh, that uh, their plan is probably wrong. It'll be wrong but the, by the time it's written, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'll start with a conviction about the market fit, the need, the market that's addressable, the scale of it, the business model, etc. But they'll need to adjust. And the, the fact is, you know, eight, seven or eight out of ten startups fail. Mm-hmm. So, you know... That's normal. That's the majority, right? And those that survive and come through that are led by people with the resilience to pick themselves up when they get something wrong, with the agility to pivot at the right Mm. moments, the persistence to continue trying until they've fully explored something as well, uh, and the humility to know that they're not the oracle of all answers. These are the characteristics of, of founders who are more likely to succeed. So when an, an, when angel investing or when VC investing, you know those tend to be the attributes of a, uh, of a founder. It helps to have a bit of a track record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I'm particularly attracted to people, uh, founders who have had a couple of missteps. You know, yeah. if you're a founder who, who who's had a company or two that's failed, like you don't you you wouldn't want to sort of att- attract a serial failure, right, in, in that sense. But I think a healthy notion of what it feels like yeah. and, and the characteristics that lead to failure of some sort is a really, really interesting learning. That person's going to be much wiser than somebody who's had three successful exits and hasn't been tripped up along the way yet. Mm, yeah. That's really interesting. Um you, you wear a lot of different hats, to say the least. I think with your with your work at Google as well as an angel investor, you've got your podcast. You're also an author. Um, what what do you think w- w- would you say is that is a driving factor behind you getting out of bed and doing all of these different things? And your actual what what is that source of motivation? Where, where does that come from for you? Yeah, my wife describes me as an active relaxer. <laughs> I think it's balance, right? It's uh, I, I'm, I'm a great believer. You know, I, I don't think there's any job that fully satisfies all of your interests. Mm-hmm. That's certainly true for me. And being able to explore those interests um, across a spectrum of pursuits and disciplines and industries is a, a great way to uh, to to live a complete life, right? That that serves many many passions and many interests. So it's uh, it's that really. And I'm very fortunate to work for a company and be in a place 
that encourages that and gives the sort of oxygen and space to explore it, as, as are you guys. Hence, you're sitting here doing a, a, a podcast in the middle of a working day. <laughs> Hybrid working. We're, we're all Hybrid excited. working, excuse <laughs> me. <about that>. Still. <laughs> I think I've, in particular, I think I, I, I came across your channel when I watched in Zach and Jay show or something. Yeah. Uh, I think you had an episode with them. Like Mo said, you do have a lot of plates spinning all the time. I think when I've been in a situation where I've got multiple plates spinning in my own life, I kind of find it difficult to set the time aside to kind of do everything. Yeah. And I, and I find that nowadays when I read around the subject, time blocking is quite an effective yeah. system people use to kind of get all the things they need to get done. Is that something that you kind of advocate for? Do you have another system which you use or is it a bit of a free-for-all and you kind of do it? As and when you please. I'm going to answer that question, but first I'm going to do a plug on the Zach and Jay show, which has <laughs> been rebranded actually. It's, it's Zach Allsop now. It yeah. was uh, Zach Allsop and Jamie Wilson. Jamie um, is a serial entrepreneur actually. Not many people know that about uh, Jamie. He's, he now lives a very, very happy life in Mexico. Oh, nice. Okay. But the two of them were these sort of hijink scallywags who got up to, <laughs> you know, getting backstage at events and, uh, you know, selling lemonade outside Bill Gates' house in Seattle and <laughs> all sorts of things. And um, I've interviewed both of them or each of them individually on what it what it is to be a YouTuber. And I took Jamie on a flight. I, so I fly planes for fun. Nice. It's a hobby. And I said, why don't you come with me? Let's go to Scotland. So he came with me and he vlogged that. And, and that sits on their channel and the interview sit on mine. Um, anyway, so what, what was the question? That was the Zach and Jay show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess I was just looking at kind of the time management element of it. Yeah, time management. Yeah, so blocking, you, you talked about blocking, and I think that's a, important. So I'm, I'm very disciplined with my calendar. Everything is scheduled. I have an excellent um, a personal assistant, uh, Melanie, who, who is amazing uh, as a business partner and helps create space. I schedule three blocks of two hours every week just uh, of me time. It's, uh, I call it focus time. So it's, it's sort of getting the head down and, and, and doing, um, you know, doing, doing work, right? I, I may lead a team. I'm, I'm a senior, senior person in Google, but we're all individual contributors and we need the time to do that. Uh, outside of that, I'm, I'm fairly uh, intentional about uh, scheduling stuff. So on Friday mornings, I meet with the team from my film and television company. Mm -hmm. uh, on Monday evenings, uh, usually I, I meet with the team from my record label. Uh, and we mix that up according to what's going on at the, t uh, at the time. You know, we put an album okay. out under the record label back in August around Notting Hill Carnival. That was quite busy. We were meeting, you know, probably every day and we had artists in, in the studio in the evening but that typically those side hustle type things happen outside uh, the day job so I'm disciplined about keeping that day job um, time boxed off and uh, being quite intentional and structured about the time that I spend outside that and I think you've got to do that otherwise just you know if you don't manage life life manages you <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good way of putting it um I also want to touch on something you mentioned, your, your film production company and your music label. So I, I guess in your day-to-day -day role, it's quite a technical role, kind of, some would say science-y and technology-focused, whereas a film production company and a, a music label is very creative. Would you, would you say you've always had that balance, or do you think it was only later in your career you kind of figured out, I need that creative element to kind of thrive? Probably only later, actually. Um, but I do find that, like, I, I'm not a creative with a capital C. Like, a creative <laughs> with a capital C is somebody who can sing. I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. My 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 wife took the guitar away from me when I tried to start learning it. I can't dance, certainly according to my children. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a creative. I can't draw. Uh, I'm not a creative in that sense. But I, I think creativity comes in many guises. I would call uh, call myself a creative with a small C, and I think it, just in business we have a different word for it. Mm -hmm. It's innovation, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. It's it's thinking yeah. uh, it's thinking in a lateral way about a business problem and seeing around the corners and uh, and, and coming up with fresh new ideas to uh, to tackle it. The YouTube um, side of things, as well as the music company and the film and television, is another outlet. 
Uh, you'll be pleased to know that I don't sing on any of my albums. <laughs> <laughs> Though I actually have recorded a track. I, I did. I, I did an ode to Jackie Weaver. Remember that, that sort of uh, count, hand, handforth council meeting, that uh, you know, that <laughs> terrible meeting that happened during lockdown. They thought, well, well I'm going to le- learn how to make a beat and I'm going to rap on it. So <laughs> I have done it. But usually it's not me. You can be the intro to this podcast. We need a sample. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> please, yeah. and no, you, you're trying to put, build an audience, right? <laughs> Careful. Uh, yeah, uh, but I, I, I love the process of bringing creatives together. And, and actually that, you know, that's the producer role. That's the role of a, a producer both in music as, as well as in uh, film and television. The producer's role is to bring the parts together. And, and manage in a structured way towards a creative outcome, whether it's an album, a music video, a, mm-hmm. uh, an episode, a uh, TV episode, um, or a film, uh, etc. And actually on the YouTube channel, it's, it's also, for me, a, a great creative outlet. I think I'm pretty crap in front of a camera. I you know, <laughs> still find it rather, um, rather embarrassing and uncomfortable, but I love editing. You know, that's my creative out. It's like a paint pro- that that, yeah. that I can do. Uh, or I'm, you, you be the judge of that. But I'm, <laughs> I, I think I'm becoming better at it, and I'm certainly enjoying it. So, you know, whether I'm com- becoming better at it, that's the main thing. Yes, yeah, so we've got a quick fire round. Um, so some of the questions we've come up with, some of the questions I've asked potential audience members. Oh. Um, so I guess I'll start with the one that I want to kind of know from you the most is... What is your favourite movie genre? Sci-fi. Sci-fi. Okay. Favourite fiction book? Favourite fiction book. I'm a big Lee Child fan, so Jack Reacher. Anything Jack Reacher. Yeah. No, they've got a TV show now as well, don't they? Jack Reacher. Yeah, a movie. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I watched it. It was really good. I mean, on that end, favourite non-fiction book? Ooh, non-fiction book. I am a huge Richard uh, Fenman fa- fan. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's a physicist, or was yeah. a physicist. He's dead now. And uh, I, I think the book's called The Beauty of Finding Things Out or something similar mm-hmm. to that. Uh, I also, while I was, a, I, I'm going to cheat here. I'm going to give you a second one. <laughs> when I was at business school, my strategy professor, Don Sull, prescribed a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And if you put it to one side, the slightly sexist title, mm-hmm. it's by a guy called uh, Victor Frankl, spelled F-R-A-N-K-L. Uh, he talks about his experience uh, as a uh, Holy, Holocaust survivor. So he was in a Holocaust survivor. He, uh, he was in a concentration camp. And I think it's a great... Uh, Rather a transformation, but I've got lots. Of, I, I I read a lot of nonfiction. Why we sleep is another one. Matthew Walker. Yeah, I think you got your aura ring on as well. For the, I do. The I have my aura ring. Yeah. I, I think he actually works for aura. He might be a scientific advisor for them. He could be an advisor. Uh, he's certainly um, an advocate of yeah. the product. But I think that was one of the most transformational books I read. Um, TLDR, by the way, in case you don't have time to read it, turns out sleep's important. You need seven to eight hours uh, a night. And if you're one of those people who believe you need less, you're wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I take that personally. (laughs) (laughs) Last one to end with, uh, Ronaldo Messi. Mm. Ronaldo. You've got a fan in me now. (laughs) (laughs) We we, we always have a fight about this. He's, He's a Messi fan. Well, Messi, Messi is an amazing, amazing. Well, they're both skillful footballers. Messi, in particular, I think during the World Cup was uh, yeah, was, was incredible. I I kind of watched a little bit more of Ronaldo's content. I guess you know he's got these sort of fly on the wall stuff, and he seems like I don't know the guy. I haven't met him, before, but he <laughs> seems like he's a kind of a nice guy. Who does? Um, not that Messi's not, by the way. I just I know less about him. So. I just like kind of round it all up and kind of end the podcast here. The last question I want to ask you is, what does the future look like for Craig Fenton? Who knows? Hopefully lots, lots more excitement. I'll continue to follow my curiosity mm. and my passion wherever it takes me. I'm very happy, very happy Googler. You know, it's a nice, nice place to be. But it's also importantly a, a place that gives me lots of scope to play outside that. And... 
you know, I, I continue to focus more on the why than the what. My why is I love building things and changing things, and I love to do that in a technology-based context. So wherever that takes me, I will go. Thanks very much for your time, Craig, and hopefully we'll get you on the podcast again soon. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.